What I always that? do things wrong. I'm the one that does things the hard way. Oh, stop. <laughs> I am. But so we're Great Leap is uh, 1978 we got established. And really one of the reasons why Great Leap got established was because of the work that Chris and I did uh, yes. with a grain of sand, mm -hmm. Chris and me and Charlie Chin. And that set us, all three of us, on a journey, even though we didn't stay together much longer after that. Mm -hmm. uh, we all went on a journey to, to, to use whatever we knew and learned from our experience in Grain of Sand yeah. to, to take it to our communities. And, and each of us in different ways, Chris is a lawyer, but he never stopped making music. Mm. He always... And when he was teaching law, with every class he would write a song. You know, when he moved to Hawaii, he was writing songs about uh, Hawaii. You know, mm -hmm. so there was he was always writing, even though he was a lawyer and a teacher, a law teacher. And then Charlie is uh, he works in in uh, San Francisco Chinatown as, and he's sort of a, uh, in the uh, they have. What is it? A museum or something? A Chinese Historical Society uh -huh. that he's oh, part okay. of. And so he's a storyteller. And, that yeah. one song of his is yeah. such, it tells the whole story, right? Yeah, there, right. One song. Yeah. I can't believe it. Oh. So, I remember I went out and walked in the park, in the Chinese park, and taped voices so they would have a chatter. Right, that was, that was beautiful. <laughs> yeah, just the sound of that. It was, uh, yeah. But, that song so, you know, if fun. you had not. Barbara, if you had not had the gumption or vision or whatever <laughs> to record a grain of sand, that music would have just disappeared. Mm. Or you know, but now uh, pe young people have have taken. It's part of Asian American studies. Mm. People are studying and reading about it. People are, um, you know, listening. Have made mixtapes and did their own lyrics over it. Oh. Uh, I mean, all kinds of things, and, and uh, so it's, it's had a big meaning to the Asian American movement and to the memory of that movement, because these things have a short memory. People have a short memory. So there are exhibits that's in Chinatown uh, in New York. There's an exhibit in which the music is there. Oh, and here cool. in uh, Los, Angeles, Los Angeles, there's an exhibit called Roots, and it's an exhibit there, and, and of course in the Smithsonian. So, yeah. you know. Yeah, that was, you my, know, that was such a, being, being able to put the whole label in the Smithsonian was such a, a stroke of luck, really, and uh, Moash, you know, paved the way because he, he, he knew that all that work he had done and all that huge archive of material that Folkways represented, he didn't want to see just, Mm, turn into dust and mm -hmm. disappear. So he made that arrangement, and uh, then we kind of followed in after that. You know, Pete Seeger's mm, cousin, I think, uh, Anthony Seeger, was running it at the time. Tony Seeger. And mm -hmm. Tony knew about the label, even though I'd never met him. But when I contacted him, he immediately said, you know, he said, oh, yeah, 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 that'd be great. Because he'd been using it, I guess, in some of his work, and um, so, you know, it's just, it was just amazing to me that, that those songs and all of the things, not, it doesn't amaze me that the songs and the work you guys did lives on because it would have anyway. It was great, strong stuff, very timely and still timely. I mean, right now you could take any of those songs and still play it and it would still be valid and it would still be, it would sound fresh. You'd think someone wrote it yesterday. We are the children of the, that, I mean... You couldn't write anything that would be more or less long lasting and valid. I don't even think this land is your land. Is I, can, I have a hard time singing that because it doesn't include anything about the native people. And um, but you know your song has got the whole story there, and uh, so I'm very proud of having been associated with it at all. And it was so accidental in a way. Well, it was kind of have to give Ed Pearl some credit, right? Yes, that's he true. he put that show together that night. So that was the place that we, that we met. met. Yes, we were on a show that Ed put together with a Vietnamese uh, student that he found from Long Beach, I guess, they were down there studying 
These were that was another that night. Was a, that was I think they were UCLA. Night. They were UCLA students. Uh, or... they were specially brought to the country through some uh, State Department, whatever. I don't know exactly what, but it was a program in order to educate some young Vietnamese to become the future lackeys, you know, to be the English-speaking, America-loving, uh, you know, capital capital system organizing, loving mm. people to come there and, and run Vietnam after we had uh, demolished, you know, whatever resistance to that. And they didn't want to do that. You know, obviously they didn't, once they got there and they were in, caught up in this program, they could see what it was that they'd been sold a bill of goods, you know, I guess. I never met any of them since then. Have you? Have you ever? Yes. Yeah? I have. Yes. Well, and tell they, me about that. And they have an organization called something, Sunshine Vietnam or something like that. And they're still doing work to make life better in Vietnam. But I also want you to know that my partner, uh, artistic co-artistic director Dan Kwong, just came back from Vietnam and they asked us both to come there and teach uh, there at the Vietnam, uh, Saig the Saigon International Film School because oh. they're having a... What two of, of our students that we taught here more than 10 years ago returned to Vietnam. And they were the children, boat children. They were, they were on boats, you know, and they, it was a very controversial program that we did. Mm -hmm. And I helped them create a piece called Laughter from the Children of War. Mm -hmm. And they got to tell their stories. And, and they title. Yeah, and they, they, were, they were wonderful. And, so, you know, they had a lot of arguments about, well, Ho Chi Minh was a traitor, or Ho Chi Minh was a nationalist, and, you know, they, they had to figure out where they stood about a lot of things and why the war happened. Anyway, so two of them went back. Now, one, both of them are very heavily into the film industry, which is really growing oh, there, yeah. and they want us to in come Vietnam. there in Vietnam, and they don't oh. have a shortage of trained actors and performers and they want us to come and help them. So it's really interesting how things, you know, yeah. come yeah. around and go around. Yeah. 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 But, but anyway, so, so we were, Ed Pearl, who's still around. He's still around. I talked to him every, pretty recently. Uh, but Ed had the concept for that night that this would be, this would be music of this whole other point of view from start to finish would be, not just uh, from a kind of external uh, support of the peace movement or whatever, something based on what, based on the needs of Americans wanting the war to end and bring our troops home and all that. That's all great. But on the other hand, what's going on over there and what's going on with those people and, and what's going on in general, how does that hook into what, I guess that's why I wanted you guys on there, how, how it hooks up with being Asian in America, and because, you know, Ed, you, I, all of us who are involved in this, the one uniting thread, I believe, is that we're all anti-imperialists. Right. We are, we can all agree on that. And what, what was a big part of uh, getting involved in the Asian American movement was the Vietnam War, because those people looked like we did. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know if you've come across a a record, uh, a song that's on one of the, it's on What Now People One, I believe, or one of those What Now People song magazine on a record that I was trying to make happen all the time. Very hard to do. Uh, but anyway, I ran into this guy. Well, it's a story I love to tell because it's so emblematic, really. About so this, I'm going up through the crowd to the stage. It's a big crowd in Washington. It's a big rally. It's about amnesty after the war. And asking for amnesty for these guys who were trapped in Sweden and Canada, can't come home, and would like to come back. So up on the stage as I'm coming, I see this guy up there. He's singing a song that I know the tune of. I don't know how to sing it, but... Anyway, I saw that, and he's moving seems like a Vietnamese person, he's singing in Vietnamese, he moves like a Vietnamese person. So anyway, I get back to the backstage and his, he's off now and, and when he comes off stage, I introduce myself and, and I said, 
what you know, I'm Barbara, and he uh, he says, well, I'm Alfonso Ray Riotti. Oh, I'm uh, he was a he was a prisoner of war in the Hanoi Hilton, but everybody else in there were white guys, highly trained college graduates, blah blah blah, you know, lieutenants and on up, whatever, not nothing to do with. He, on the other hand, was a Marine foot soldier. They arrived in Vietnam by having the plane shot down and they're brought into the place and they don't know anything about Vietnam or any of the people or anything about anything. They just know about how to run an airplane. This guy was walking, th- he was a Marine, he's supposed to walk through this field and kill the people coming toward him. And he, he said, he said, they looked like, oh, it seemed like it was grannies and children and they all look like me. And I said, well, what, what is that, how does that, come into it, you know, he said, well, I'm half Filipino and half Native American, and um, my parents are farm workers, but I joined the Marines because there wasn't any future for me, and uh, then I, when I saw these people coming at me, I, I couldn't do anything, and I was captured, I couldn't, you know, so he was captured that way, and then he winds up in Hanoi Hilton, so he says, but they, the, the other guys, would never didn't relate to him socially, so he was isolated because they didn't understand this brown kid who is a farm worker, you know, with not much education, from California, and all. And so he's 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 isolated. So he said, "Well, I I asked the Vietnamese. I said, I I I I would like to be able to help you. I see that you're working hard to keep us in food and all this and that. Can I do something?" So they put him to work in the kitchen. He could get up five a.m. every morning and go in with the cooks, and he cook and they sing while they work so he learned all these Vietnamese songs in perfect Vietnamese and of course as they move he moves so he has all the right body language and he just he he just completely developed this other life while he's in prisoner of war so that that story so I said Ray would you be willing to record this yes I would course he, he he recorded it very nicely and it's in the thing you can check it out it's right there on the uh, Smithsonian Folkways website where, where you look up Paradon Records and then you see all the different covers and you look for what now people or you just put in Alfonso Ray Riotti R-I-A-T-E or I, I I forget if it's I or E anyway a wonderful young guy, and I, the last I heard about him is he went back to the Philippines to look for his Filipino roots. Mm. I haven't heard from him ever since, but that was such a wonderful story to me, to, to meet this young man, and it sort of pulled a lot of things together in my mind, you know, like, who would imagine? A farm worker kid from the fields here, you know, turns out to be that kind of person and that kind of spirit and make make somehow friends with his adversaries or shall we call it and no oh, it's great <laughs> it's great yeah so paradigm you know had a i started it because of uh coming back from the uh cancion protesta which was this enormous enormous contribution to world culture that was the cubans again cubans organized uh i think of in cultural terms, um, there are two or three events that have happened in the world that we know nothing much about in this country. It never hits the history books or the newspapers. One is this uh, World Youth Festivals, which have been going I went to the first one in 1947 in Prague. And the whole world of youth, we're all just coming off this war. And, you know, all, from every kind of angle, some, I mean, from... 60 odd countries it came and we were in Prague for a month hosted by the Czech people running around the streets singing and dancing for, for a month and it's still going on they have this festival every couple of years all over the world this World Youth Festival and it's it, the US was going to participate in the beginning they were actually the uh, when it was first proposed Actually, you would know some of the names maybe because the first um, I have I have them listed in my my book my biography that I'm writing uh, because I I was so fascinated with the fact that it, those people were willing to do this. But 
as as part of what we would would have put on in Prague from our standpoint. Almost every name you can think of in the modern dance world wanted to go. It was it was all listed mm-hmm. on the ready to go. Every all the names you, you name me a name and I'll I'll show you what what it is. So they're all ready to go. Arthur Miller was just had this play called All My Sons, which is a very powerful anti-war play. Had be, just become a great success. He had figured out sending the whole cast, and they were going to do the play there. Uh, a few other things of that scope, you know. But the U.S. State Department, you know, decided instead of. I mean, they could have if they were smart. They're not smart, really. They do dumb things all the time. If they'd been smart from their point of view, they could have sent all this great stuff and shown what a great country we are and blah 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 and how we don't you know and beefed it up with their style of uh, of culture and uh, but they didn't they pulled it, they were going to pay for transportation for all these people to go pulled it out right at the last minute even though Eleanor Roosevelt was uh, with you know helping promote it was really thought it was a great idea this World Youth Festival thing and. Um, so it wound up instead of the I don't know it was three or four thousand from here or planning to go wound up being two hundred or so who actually went, but that was one of from my own experience that was one of the great things that made me into an internationalist because you know just seeing all these all these people who some of them were coming out of you know terrible wartime conditions. And uh, some going back with the threat of all kinds of. Some came from Franco Spain. Some came from uh, Greece, where you know there was fascists still running around. Where they still are. <laughs> uh, anyway, so that was that was one thing that you know. And then the other thing I think of always uh, next. I'm getting to the one I originally was heading for. Um, the other big cultural event that was organized by. Uh, essentially by the Communist International uh, was the uh, cultural input to the Spanish Civil War when people like Paul Robeson and Langston Hughes and Nicolas Guillén and no, 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 lots of people went people from the Soviet Union went, people from other countries in Europe went and became cultural uh, part of the Spanish Civil War you know, put their work out there and help to encourage everybody to do what they had to do. Okay, so those two things have been just washed off of our culture and our mm-hmm. knowledge of the past. And all right, so then comes this Cuban Cancion Protesta, to which I believe it was, no, I don't know how many countries, but people, I know there was a, there were a couple of people from as far away as Australia and uh, a Vietnamese uh, uh, cultural uh, unit came from the, basically from the if there's fronts in a guerrilla war <laughs> they came from the front <laughs> there are people from Latin American countries who went back and were put in jail for going like from Uruguay Daniel Villetti, a great artist you know, came and he went to jail for being part of the Tupumaros and uh, <laughs> anyway that that festival what were they, no sorry take back the word festival because they very specifically, did not call it a festival because it was in the Woodstock era. They didn't want people to think of it as like we're going to go lay around in the mud and smoke grass, you know, not at all. It's the opposite. These are people who are activists who want to change the world or, you know, a whole different thing. And um, so that meeting was, for me, was like... uh, a culmination of all this sort of impulse toward internationalism, you know, and and uh, seeing culture as a way of, of of spreading that and tying groups together and all of that. So, and I'm a singer, okay. So, and I have very few resources. So, what first thing I did was tried to uh, I took back as many songs as I could. I tried to learn to sing them in their languages. That didn't fly. How am I going to share this with the American public? I don't know. I started translating them. I made singable translations for several songs. Well, that was kind of satisfying for me, but it actually wasn't. 
And it suddenly dawned on me, well, they, people have to hear the voices of the actual people who are making these songs from these different countries, hear their own accents and their languages. Their... So I started thinking the best thing to do would be a record label. But of course, I didn't have 10 cents to do that. But then I, but I was married to Erwin Silver. Now, Erwin had worked with Folkways for quite a few years in, in, at the same time that he edited Sing Out magazine and, and ran Oak Publications so, and wrote books and all this stuff he was doing. But he did know about pressing records and getting covers made and the, this nitty gritty of making a, making a record label. Uh, I started telling everybody that I ran into. You know, people always say, well, how are you doing? What are you up to now? You know, so I go, well, I'm starting a record label. I just kept saying it as a fact. I'm doing this. And but I and, and then once in a while, somebody would say, well, how are you going to fund it? You know, oh, well, I need funding. Yeah, sure. If you've run into anybody, you might want to back, be some backing. Well, one day I get a phone call from a woman who'd spent quite a bit of time in Cuba as a translator and was kind of a, you know, a Cubophile. Anyway, she called and she said, I got a guy, I think I got the guy who'll give you some money for the thing. Can he come over in, in a couple hours for dinner? Oh, oh, yes. So I run out and get some, you know, stuff and come back and start neatening up the house real fast. And then they come. And I was prepared to, you know, some guy person who has a lot of money probably is, a, you know, in a suit and tie and all that kind of thing. No, this guy's a real, he's dressed like, you know, uh, a rich hippie, you know, lots of leather and whatever. <laughs> anyway, turns out he, he's the son of a very, 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 very big, I don't know, bunch of money from tobacco. Mm. And he's the, he's the renegade. He doesn't believe in any of that. He doesn't want that. He doesn't want to be part of that. So, in fact, he had a he had a sort of a. He said he. Well, I want to tell that. I guess I want. But because, okay. So all right, I want to I want to back this. Uh, help you. I'll give you one check, from the next, stock dividends. Whatever it is, I can't tell you. I don't know what it's going to be. But I'll send you that. The only conditions are you never ask for any more. Never report back to me. Don't show me what you've done, anything. Just go ahead and do what you got to do. Boom. So he gave me $17,000, I think it was, is what showed up in the mail one day. And that, in those days, record labels, you know, the main public, I mean, the pay, you know, professional ones or whatever, were spending that much on, you know, one record. Or one session, or I don't know, lots of money they were pouring down the drain for. But I knew it could be done, you know, what I wanted to do could be done much more economically. And that was the only capitalization we ever had. The rest was all off of sales of, of CDs. We just kept plowing it back, not CDs, records, LPs. We kept plowing it back, that's all. And we didn't, we didn't have any offices. We did it in the back room of the house, you know, the apartment. Or, yeah, we, we had a spare room in the back and that's what we use and I do the layouts for the booklets on the kitchen table with a you know a piece of glass so I wouldn't cut the table with a razor blade I'd cut the thing up and paste up the booklets and um, anyway I learned how to do all the different things and I knew I had an idea I wanted to be follow the example of folkways had these booklets that would have a lot of information but most of them were pretty disorganized and I want to know I want this to be each booklet would have something about the organization that produced this, that is the musical organization or the individual. What was the political underpinnings for their work? Where did they come out of? What was the conditions in their in their country which was creating, causing the need for a resistance movement or a revolutionary movement? And um, it just... Uh, and then, and then it would always wrap up with, uh, how can you relate to that group? You know, how work, how can you contribute if you want to support it or write about it or whatever? And uh, here's how you do that. And uh, okay, so I learned how to do all that, and I I just loved doing it. But it was all on the fly while I was doing GI organizing, running around the world. You know, so I, 
I go off to here and then I come back and do a couple of intense work, you know, on the week's work on the on the some record I was doing. And I go off again and come back and okay. <laughs> but I heard you also went with your own tape recorder oh, to uh, yeah. countries in the field do field recordings. Yes, I did, but uh, I I did a certain amount of that. Some people, for example, there's a terrific Haitian group of exile Haitians in New York. Well, I brought them in the studio. They they were there. Things like that where I could actually put put them in good conditions and like I did with Grain of Sand, you know. Found Jonathan Thayer, a wonderful engineer, and Jonathan, uh, it was you know it wasn't up to him to set the prices. He was working for a studio. He was just a hired hand at the studios, but but he personally got very involved with the material. He loved it. You know, I just I, I don't know how I met him. I was trying to think how I found Jonathan, but he right away got very involved with the liking it. For example, when I put out the Ho Chi Minh speaks. Well, <laughs> I had first I had a, a collective of people. I asked, asked two or three people to get together and pick out from all of Ho Chi Minh's writings what should be on there, and so they picked they picked out things and made a text. And I wanted the focus to be party building, because it was building that party that was able to provide the organization from which they were eventually able to liberate the country. So you need an organization, and I wanted to make that manifest. Yeah. So we did. Pick, they picked that out. I knew there were some songs around there, very special songs, like Pablo Milanes had a beautiful song in there. Uh, and, uh, well, it's I can't sing it. It's a very hard melody, but it's a beautiful song. And well, I wrote several songs that I that I inserted in there and all that. But anyway, I wanted the material in Ho Chi Minh's writing to be read in a voice that would be authoritative, that would be Vietnamese, that un understandable to American listeners. It wouldn't give them too much work to do and then they'd give up on it, you know. So I kept listening around all the time when I'd be around any Vietnamese people, which was normally only a, on a platform you're going to do a, a rally and, and the rally organizers have dug up some Patriots who are in, available in this country or maybe in Canada or got them from somewhere and I would listen and, and mostly the voices were were the language was the accent was too hard to penetrate for a long thing you know um, or they were the voices were too high and sort of didn't sound like you would think of Ho Chi Minh being all of a sudden I hear one on one rally I, I'm listening to the, the Vietnamese speaker and his voice is exactly right his voice very clear english and his uh, accent and you know it, and it's kind of lower voice lower more in the tonal range that we're used to in this country so i asked him would you like to read ho chi minh's thoughts on a record whoa he was thrilled he was absolutely thrilled so he came to town and he came to, made a special trip he lived in dc came up and we to record this stuff, and we recorded a whole lot of it, but everything was perfect except he had a very bad stammer, which I could not have predicted. So Jonathan put in extra hours, hours and hours with a little razor blade cutting off little pieces of stammer, and you listen to it now, it's smooth, perfect. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, so a lot, of, a lot of things like that happened, yeah. And I, I did... I always had this little, uh, some kind of recording equipment with me, but most of the time I'd, I'd come away from the situation saying, well, it's not good enough quality, because I, I didn't want to put out stuff that was really inferior sound quality. In some cases, I had to put things in that were unavailable any other way. But uh, it was important to me that people got, when they put out their, we sold the first ones for, I think it was three bucks a CD, you know, or an LP rather. And, you know, you want people to get a value that they can live with and they're happy with and listen to it. <laughs> so were, was it true that Ours was one of the first English albums? Well, not one of the very first, but it was pretty near, I guess, because I started to realize at a certain point, wait a minute, I'm doing stuff from Latin America and from here and from there. I, I need to get American-based material, and I, I know there's plenty of 
plenty of exactly what I would want, you know, but it's hard to find because it was all uh, uh, people like your group and uh, Beverly Grant's group and other people's work was not on the top 10 hit parade or anything, you know, I never get, you would never find it unless you knew what path to take to find it, so I would never have known about you guys if I wasn't singing on the program with you <laughs> at the Ash Grove. I wouldn't have known about Charlie King. I didn't record him. I, didn't, I he, he had his own label, but Charlie I met at a you know at a rally. Beverly I think I met at another rally. And the other singers that I put out from different countries, mostly I met them at some kind of event, a political event. You know, I'd, I'd hear them and say, "Oh, that's exactly right." Once I got a big long tape from the guy who was sort of at the moment the uh, at a po well never mind. This is. A, Stupid story. I won't tell that story. Forget that. So uh, with Grain, so what were you thinking about? I mean, here we were, an Asian American group uh, singing in English, uh, you know, uh, at this rally or at this program. So what, what what made you think this would be a good album to release on Paradon? To tell you the truth, I, I heard in there looking at all, all of the overview of what you do, um, or did then, I I heard a sense of solidarity with other, the world, a place in the world, not just, you know, we're this little movement over here, or we're this isolated uh, group that's been somehow marginalized and all that. I, I didn't hear that in there. It's not there. I didn't want that. What I was trying to do was put out songs and music that that wouldn't be able to be incorporated in that other world of of sort of uh, accommodation and i didn't hear that and what you guys were doing was like oh, this is you know this is our world and we're going to talk about our world the way we want to talk about it both musically and text the text and everything about it and the combination you had the you know two japanese americans and chinese american well that was Right there is a head start, you know, and uh, oh, it just was right, exactly right, exactly what I would have dreamed of having uh, found somewhere, you know, but I wouldn't have known where to find it. It wasn't any, you guys were it, <laughs> you guys were the only ones doing that, as far as I know, and uh, I think, I think that needs to be noticed too that you were way ahead of your time, the way out ahead of a lot of people's ability to concretize it and make some culture out of it, you know. You guys are out there pushing the envelope, as they say. So, yeah. And the difference and with, like, you being an organizer as well as a musician, I mean, that was something that we, we mm. were trying to... We were using the music as an organizing tool, exactly, really. Exactly, exactly, yeah. 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 That's right, and that's what I was doing. That's what Pete was doing when he started the People's Songs Bulletin way back in the 40s. Mm -hmm. That's what the whole idea is. <laughs> you know, right. not just something to show off your great voice or anything, but to m use the music as it, in an organic way that's, that's actually going to influence life and show life as it should be lived and <laughs> inspire us and make us proud of ourselves and make us... Make us, uh, well, whoever we are, you know, make us understand we can, we can put my problem together with your problem, and we can now we can lick that problem, you know. It was a big um, influence to our music was being part of the, uh, in New York City, part of the uh, movement in the uh, squatters movement. Ah, right. And where Somos Asiáticos came out of, you know, it was yeah. really showed us the importance of uh, of music in the struggle that was and the high quality of the music in the struggle of Latin America it was much more sophisticated than it felt like that the, the mm. level of writing was very uh, sophisticated and yes. uh, and the rhythms right. and the music was right. just fun and and wonderful you know so that was a big influence for us so your son's record uh, the Ho Chi Minh song that for instance mm -hmm. I listened to that over and over and over again I just loved that mm -hmm. it made it a big influence on me as a musician to hear those kinds of musicians doing political music skilled musicians skilled yeah, musicians people with their 
pa- polishing their tools and yes. using them in that way. Yeah, not just uh, expecting the audience to make a stretch and love them anyway, even though oh, you're saying the right thing, but I'm not really that much into your music. But right. <laughs> you know, not like that. It had to be both to, to make it be both. And, and I was amazed by the level of Latin American sophistication in there. Because, look, before I went to Cuba and before I was exposed to all that stuff, my training and all everyone like me went through the same school systems. Uh, unfortunately, I was trying truant. I didn't go to a lot of the school. But anyway, was that was the school system that was there. There was never anything that showed you the beauty, the respect, that you should have had for the, I mean, there it was right, right next to us, and we're talking about good neighbor policies and blah blah blah. But yet, the culture of the of the whole continent was despreciado. You know, was put down. Was like thought of as trash, trashy, well, like corny, right? Chiquita banana, and I'm here to say, you know, that would be the high level, highest level we could think of. Right. That's right. <laughs> so you know. You, you wouldn't pay attention to it. But then all of a sudden, when you start meeting all these activists and listening to the high quality of their work, po- poetically, musically, mm-hmm. and then, of course, people, I mean, the height of all of that is Victor Hara. You know, you look at... Yes. You go on the YouTube and listen, spend an afternoon listening to a, a Victor Hara over it. There's a lot of stuff out there. Also, You cannot yes. believe how great... He was. What a poet and a singer. At both and charming a musician. and dedicated and he'd be anywhere where he should be, right on the at the place where the action is and well obviously, you know. It's, he gave his life for it. He gave his life for it. He went to the extreme of that and, and and you know, that's it. A guy with that much ability certainly could have uh, you know, made a lot of money, been a lot, been a big personality and Records and that, and that, but that wasn't what he was, mm-hmm. you know. And the thing is, don't you know, people who have been in, in, in this kind of work of using your cultural tools uh, the way that you that you need and your community needs and not for just gain or fame or whatever, it you you can't go back. You can't go back. You you feel you understand how it connects you to to the world and to everything in it. I mean, the, to me, the world you know is this thing that's just breathing. The whole world is all is just breathing all the time, and I'm part of that breath, and so are you, and you know, and you're in tune with it, and you're doing something like that. Well, and you're feeling the power of of unity and solidarity, even though you don't know so-and-so. If you get to such and such country and you find this movement, you will find, if the movement's any good at all, it'll be some singers of the kind that you, you know, trust and, and you find an immediate brotherhood, sisterhood and solidarity and there you are. You can't go back from all that. That's so much more, I don't know, it's a... Uh, I remember as a as a kid, I got my first big job offer. I was about twenty, and I was desperate for money. I had no job, and I was, you know, and I got a call. To, would I want to go on the road with this well-known pop band at the time? And I thought, actually, what would I? I mean, I'd already experienced the humiliation of standing up there in a low-cut dress and singing, you know, "Shoe Fly Pie" and "Apple Pan Dotty." Makes your eyes light up and your tummy say howdy, you know. Well, as opposed to standing in front of a shop gate in front of, you know, a few thousand people coming out of work and we're all singing, we're going to roll, we're going to roll, going to roll the union on. <laughs> if the boss is in the way, we're going to roll it over him. You, you, don't, you don't want to trade yourself off for this basically prostitution role, you know. Standing in front of the band with the low cut dress and all that, for for being part of actual life, yeah. So, what do you would you say after all these years of experience that you've had? What would you tell young people today in a in a very different world that they live in, and maybe yeah. in some ways they missed that moment that we 
experience when it seemed like the whole world was turning upside down and we were rising up and we were going to change the world. We did. And we did. In, sure we did. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Don't let them tell you that we didn't change the world. We definitely did change the world. Between what the Vietnamese people were doing, tightening their belt and marching down the Ho Chi Minh Trail with a bunch of ammunition or whatever on your back, a big load and on your back, and, and eating a rice ball for your food and whatever and all that. You know, that uh, and... <laughs> I, I, it's just oh, the image just somehow over swept swept over me to see, think of that. Um, and why was I talking about that? In specific image. Hmm. Well, you're gonna have to edit right here because I'm drawing a blank about where I was going with that. So young people today. Okay. All right. So yeah. But so we saw we've we've lived through we that is of the Vietnam era and, and every era really, we've lived through watching people suffer and give all they have and and be willing to live and to die for their what they believe in, and we see that how fulfilling that is and so all of that can't possibly be equated with this empty life we're handed in in a world of. Uh, where everything's for sale and everything's uh, filtered through someone else's agenda, it, 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 we wouldn't, we wouldn't, we wouldn't want the world to be a world controlled by someone else's agenda like that. We wouldn't want, and as young people, I think I know it's hard. It's people have had much more difficult times than we have here. We have terrible times now for young people here. But people have had like much more difficult and still overcome, you know. I don't know, just the I main uh, prime examples would be like Mandela spending X M Mumia Abu Jamal has been in solitary and in prison for over thirty years. I think it's thirty eight years going on. That man still has his wits about him, still fighting, making incredible analysis and statements of writing carrying on, I mean, having a life, even though nobody wants to give him even a little piece of sunshine. So there's a lot worse and more fearful things than not being able to pay the rent. You know, you can you can find a friend who will let you sleep on their couch or whatever. But, but I mean, I what I'm really trying to say is you have to know what you're living for and live it. If you don't, it's no point in being here, you know. Hang it up. If you don't live that thing that you believe, it's it's just, it's foolish. What would you do? Sit around and I don't know what you would do if you didn't have a movement to be in or part of or a a goal, a a, a sense of. And I'm I'm going to tell you something. Everybody that tells me, oh, I'm so down because, you know this. Oh, I don't even want to say his name, Dumple Stilskin or whatever his name is. Um, is in in the presidential seat, and there, there has been an an economic coup. They're replacing all of the people who know about government and that kind of uh, rule of law. They're replacing them with people who only know the rule of business, and who run, you know, who want to run the world like a huge corporation, which they're benefiting from. Well, we see that, but that isn't going to last. It doesn't last. It won't last. Rome fell, right? <laughs> Rome fell. Um, wasn't built in a day, as they say, but it fell. Uh, the British Empire fell. French Empire fell. Spanish Empire fell. This one's going to fall, too. That's why I sing a song by Alan Toussaint called On Your Way Down. It says something about it. It's... The sun rises and the sun sets, but it shines on the poor folks too. And it, uh, when you fly high, sometimes you can't see what's around you, but uh, it's high time that you find that the same people you walk over when you're on your way up, you're going to meet them on your way down. That's the way I sing about this administration. <laughs> so. There will be a way down, and you can, um, 
you can be a bystander or you can push it a little bit, make it happen. I think my favorite word these days is resistance. It's going to move beyond resistance at some point because they're going to move beyond resisting us. They're going to, it, it very definitely, I mean, look, we live in a country we don't, we don't have. We, we've seen tanks now being brought into cities and put in place. We've seen police forces dressed in military garb. We've seen all this stuff in their minds preparing for some kind of military coup if this economic coup doesn't completely, you know, uh, take, sink in. And boy, there's too much opposition to that. They've got the military. Okay, it could come to that. But do you realize we haven't had that happen here? We haven't. Everybody else, look around you. What other countries mm -hmm. kind of avoided having people shot in the streets and armies marching through the, you know, every, every, all over Europe, all over Latin America, you know, you, you just, uh, we, 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 we've been extremely fortunate. Americans have lived on this huge island in the way that we live on without that kind of uh, experience. But it could come to that. It very well might. But as I say, we are only, we're only one or two of the society. There's a lot more. If we get killed, this is a whole bunch behind us. There's a great Greek song that I like to, that I translated from Theodorakis and the great poet uh, Yanis Rizos. It's, it's, well, and if they fall one day, and if they, and if they fall one day, and if they fall one day, if they fall one day, is drumming going on. And if they fall one day, look behind and see the others coming. Look behind and see the others coming. They advance, they advance with flags and drumming. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Thank you so much. Thank oh, you for well. allowing us to have a helping us to have a, a voice that lasted a long time. Oh, so thank well, you. You guys, yeah, it meant a lot to me too, you know. It really did it, to have that in the catalog because it it gave a dimension that I really was hoping we would have, a, a, a more uh, deep grasp of American culture. And uh, I think also to be part of the the American canon, you know, I mean, uh, totally. uh, Jay, uh, Asian Americans weren't really don't have much of a corner in that, uh, in that. Yeah. No, I know. I know yes. that's true. And so. because I'm not sure. I guess it's a cultural thing with the Asian American community of being sort of don't make waves. You know, stick back here and they'll leave us alone. We've had too much grief already. Uh, I guess it's something like that because there's no uh, the kind of the kind of uh, obvious resistance that you find, right. you know, uh, from other groups it hasn't been there, but mm -hmm. it's been there. I mean, there's obviously, <laughs> obviously been the strong desire to maintain as a people part, being part of this country, being, being included in, I mean, I, I can't imagine what it would be like to be, let's say, to look, well, Pablo's had that experience. He looks and acts like a person from California, you know, my son. Well, he is, but he took, he went there when he was 14 to Cuba. Now it's 50 odd or some odd more years from there. Well, you have to remember that his culturally, he's Cuban, you know. Mm -hmm. he, when he came here as a 30 year old, let's say, he didn't know how to open a bank account or write a check or, you know. All that kind of thing. Every whatever he knew, he had to ask mom, "How do I get a driver's license?" Whatever, you know. Um, well, I bring that up because it's it's like uh, if you were if you were Asian looking and you went to China or to Japan or something, but you didn't know any Japanese or Chinese, and you didn't know the cultural ways, and you were totally a a Berkeley person or whatever, <laughs> you know. I I I think about what would that feel like. Mm. It would it would be so. So hard to kind of place yourself, whatever, and uh, and as Pablo had to do, he had to figure out how how do I. He finally realized my position in life is that I'm an American, 
who lives permanently in Cuba. Okay, that's the best definition. I'm not going to ever become Cuban, Mm because I can't. Uh, And I I am from California. Can't take that out of me either. I'm this, this here. Okay, so I could see Asian people or any group of people who you can visually identify in any way as not like the Marlboro Man or whatever the... The European... The American. The European... Uh, well, Europe is multi-shaded too, but I mean, you could say Europe, but I mean, I guess we mean Celtic or we mean... I don't know, we mean English or Scottish or some something like that. Uh, if you don't look like that, and yet you and your parents and your grandparents and your great-grandparents and your whole culture and your whole life and your whole everything is invested in this, in this place... That um, must be a very special thing to have to deal with. Yeah. So um, to find people who knew how to express that in a song and make it come out like, yeah, so what? We are somebody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here we are. <laughs> and uh, we have just as much of stake in this whole thing as you do, and we're going to fight with you for good stuff and... Oh, it's all right there in that same album. All all right there. Going back and listen to it. It's great. It's really great. Really you you did something t- timeless and 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 uh, worthy of keeping forever somewhere available. 